order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Paul Blomfield, it's your lucky day, man. It is, except we didn't reach number one. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This, meeting I had, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Paul Blomfield. Uh, Sheffield Young Carers is a group supporting inspirational uh, young people who balance all the normal challenges of their young lives with the demands of caring for a parent or a sibling, often with acute needs. People like John, who's been caring for his mother with fibromyalgia from the age of 10, or Phoebe, who's been supporting her father with mental health problems from the age of 8. They have some practical ideas about what the government could do to make their lives easier. Would the Prime Minister agree to meet them and hear their proposals? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that I think it's absolutely right that he raises this issue. There are many young people who are caring for their parents, caring within, sometimes caring for their sibli other siblings as well, and all too often going unseen and unheard. And certainly one of the things that we're doing as a government is trying to ensure that we do see more opportunities, more ability to identify, to assess young carers and their families and to support them and to make the rights of young carers clearer. And I know that the Department of Health and Social Care is intending to publish a plan setting out our targeted cross-government action on this area, but I'd happy to be happy to meet with a group of young carers to hear directly from them. Mr Ronald J. Wardener. Uh, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I believe in a global Britain and I want us to trade freely with the world, so can my right honourable friend explain the difference between a customs union and a customs arrangement? There seems to be some confusion. <laughs> Can I say to my honourable friend that he's absolutely right. We want to be able to have a good trading relationship with the European Union, but we also want to be able to negotiate trade deals around the rest of the world with an independent yeah. trade uh, policy. And I was rather confused because I heard a speech earlier in the week, which I believe was given by the Labour leader on this uh, subject, where he said that he wanted Labour to negotiate a new comprehensive customs union. That would mean we couldn't do our own trade deals uh, and, uh, and actually would betray the vote of the British people. Yeah. And in, a, in about the next sentence, he said he wanted a customs arrangement, meaning we could negotiate our new trade deals. Well, that's the government's position. So what does he want to do, let down the country or agree with the government? Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Good, good afternoon, Mr Speaker. I hope the whole House will join me in passing our deepest condolences to the families of the people who died and those injured in the explosion in Leicester. In the constituency of my friend, the member for Leicester West, could we say thank you to all the emergency services and hospital staff who worked to save lives in that terrible situation? Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister emerged from her Chequers Away Day to promise a Brexit of ambitious managed divergence. <laughs> Could she tell the country what on earth ambitious managed divergence will mean in practice? Can I, can I first of all say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that I join him and I'm sure the whole House in expressing our condolences to the family and friends of those who lost their lives in the explosion in Leicester. And I also agree with him that we should commend the activities and the work of the emergency services, who day in and day out do so much to, for all of us, but in circumstances like that, really showed the, the, the great job that they do in dealing with that, uh, in dealing with that issue. Now, he asks me, he asks me about the government's position on the European Union, where it's very simple. Uh, we want to deliver on the road to the British people. That means that we will bring back control of our laws, our borders and our money. Now, of course, that's in direct contrast with the Labour Party's position, who want to be in a customs union, have free movement and pay whatever it takes to the EU. That would mean giving away control of our laws, our borders and our money, and that would be a betrayal of the British people. Mr Speaker, I understand the Prime Minister is going to make a speech about this on Friday, but I hope she will address the concerns of 94 per cent of small and medium-sized businesses who say the government is ignoring their concerns about how we leave the EU. 
But who does she think might be better at identifying the business opportunities of the future? The Confederation of British Industry, the Engineering Employers Federation and the Institute of Directors or the International Trade Secretary? Well, the, uh, the right hon. Gentleman talks about the views of business and talks about the views of small business. Can I just uh, refer him to what the Federation of Small Businesses has said about our position? The UK small business community sees the potential wins of an independent UK global trade policy. We want trade kept as easy as possible with the EU27. That's our position. Small businesses are pushing to export to new growth areas. The US, English-speaking nations, emerging economies and the Commonwealth. A good trading relationship with the European Union and free trade deals around the rest of the world under an independent sovereign nation. Mr Speaker, the International Trade Secretary says that business organisations and TUC have got it all wrong, that they don't know best how to prosper or grasp opportunities. I just put it gently to her. It might be they've got more of a clue than he has about the interests of business jobs and living standards. Last week, the Health Secretary, and it's wonderful to see him here today, I assume he was speaking on behalf of the government when he said there will be areas and sectors of industry where we agree to align our regulations. He seems to know the answer. So can the Prime Minister enlighten the rest of us as to which sectors of the government wants to remain aligned and which they plan to diverge? Well, first of all, the Right Honourable Gentleman himself has, admit, has uh, said that I'm going to be making a speech on these issues later this, uh, later this week. So he could... Uh... Just calm down. I've already, I've already set out. I've already set out in some detail the position that the government is taking. I will elaborate on that further this week. What we want to ensure is that across a variety of sectors, uh, the goods sector, uh, but also looking at issues like financial services, which are such uh, a crucial part of our economy, that we get the relationship that means that we are able to ensure that we can see that trade going across uh, the uh, borders between the United Kingdom and the remaining EU27 members and that we have no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and we're absolutely committed to differing on that. But he talks about, he talks about people not having a clue. I'll tell him who hasn't got a clue about business and jobs. That's a Labour Party that wants to borrow £500 billion and bankrupt Britain. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the endless round of after-dinner speeches by the Prime Minister on Europe doesn't really substitute for negotiations as to what is actually going to result from these negotiations altogether. One of the sectors already suffering very badly is that of health and social care. It is highly reliant, Mr Speaker, on migrant workers. We depend on them for our health and the care of those that need it. Isn't the Prime Minister just a little bit concerned that European Union workers with vital skills are leaving Britain in unprecedented numbers now? As the Right Honourable Gentleman might have noticed from the last set of immigration figures, we actually still see more people coming into the UK from the European Union than are leaving the UK uh, for uh, going back to the European Union. But we do want, we do have a care about the number of nurses and GPs that we have in the NHS. That's why we have set uh, the highest levels of training, uh, numbers of people in training for both nurses and GPs. It's why we've significantly increased the opportunities, not just for people who are coming from the European Union to work in our National Health Service, but actually for those people here in this country who want to work in our NHS to get those training places and do the excellent job that we know they will do for patients in our National Health Service. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, from a government that's cut the nurse training bursary, yeah. that doesn't seem to understand it takes eight years to train a doctor, yeah. and completely oblivious apparently to the fact that there are 100,000 vacancies in the NHS yeah. now, I suggest some members get a life and go and visit a hospital yeah. and see and see just how hard 
just how hard, hard those people work in order to cover for the vacancies that are there. Surely we need to give immediate, real assurance to EU nationals they have a future in this country. Mr Speaker, just three months ago, the Foreign Secretary told the House with regard to Northern Ireland, and I quote, there can be no hard border. That would be unthinkable. That's what he said. Yet, in a leaked letter to the Prime Minister, he wrote, even if a hard border is reintroduced, we would expect to see 95% plus of goods pass. He's shouting at the moment. He's obviously mixing up the border with the Camden-Islington border. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister confirm that she will not renege on commitments made in Phase One to keep an open border in Ireland? I say to the right honourable gentleman, he actually raised three different issues in that question, so I'll address all of them. He raised the issue of rights for European Union nationals, and of course, part of key part of the December agreement, the December joint report that we agreed with the European Union, was about the rights of EU citizens living here in the United Kingdom and the rights of United Kingdom citizens living in the EU 27. That was an important thing to have agreed uh, uh, at an early stage in the negotiations. We said we'd do it, and we did just that. He talks about the number of nurses. Of course, there are now 13,900 more nurses on our wards than there were under Labour. And just, as, just while he's talking about the number of years that it takes to train doctors, he said it takes eight years to train a doctor. Well, if he's worried about the number of doctors there are now, eight years ago it was a Labour government that was deciding the number of doctors that were going to be trained. So we can talk about that. And then. And just finally, because he referred to the position on Northern Ireland, the Foreign Secretary and I uh, are absolutely committed to ensuring that we deliver on no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. That is the position of the UK Government, it is the position of the parties in Northern Ireland, it is the position of the Irish Government, and it was what we agreed in the December agreement of that joint report. We are all committed to ensuring there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, if that is the case, then why is the Foreign Secretary in private correspondence with the Prime Minister about doing just the opposite of that was agreed in Phase 1? Mr Speaker, this is a government in disarray. Every time, every time the Cabinet meets, all we get is even more bizarre sound bites. Remember when we had Brexit means Brexit? Then we had red, white and blue Brexit, which presumably appealed to the members opposite. Then we had liberal Brexit, and now we have ambitious managed divergence. <laughs> the government is so divided, the Prime Minister is incapable of delivering a coherent and decisive plan for Brexit. So when is she going to put the country's interests before the outsized egos of her own cabinet. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, my priorities are the priorities of the British people. Yes, we are going to get Brexit right and deliver a good Brexit deal for them, but we are also building the homes that the country needs so people can own their own home. We are raising standards in our schools so our kids all get a good education. We are protecting the environment for future generations. That's a Conservative government delivering on people's priorities and giving them optimism and hope for the future, as opposed to a Labour Party that would bankrupt Britain, betray voters and drag this country down. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No, 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 Mr. Clark, you're getting overexcited. I was calling Chris Davis, the honourable gentleman behind you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I start by wishing you, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister, and indeed the whole House, 
a very happy St David's Day for yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Can I thank my right honourable friend for taking representatives, representatives of River Simple, a leader in the field of hydrogen-powered automotives and based, of course, in Brecon and Radnorshire, on her, on her recent successful trade visit to China. What is the government planning to do to help regional SMEs to make the most of potential trade opportunities with emerging markets once we leave the EU? Yeah. Yeah. Say to my honourable friend that I was very happy to take a, a large business delegation with me on the trip to China, including representatives of uh, River Simple. It was a very good trip, very positive in terms of the uh, connections and the uh, deals that were agreed as a result of that trip. I can assure him that the Department for International Trade is working hard to support SMEs across the UK to help connect buyer, uh, exporters with buyers around the world. And of course, companies in the UK can access our overseas network and our programme of international events. And I would also commend the work of colleagues around the House who are trade envoys, who are working uh, very, uh, very, including uh, my honourable friend, the member for Gloucester, who is our trade envoy for China, and who also accompanied me on that uh, trip. And I'm I'm pleased to say that last year UK Export Finance provided £3 billion in support, helping 221 UK companies, to selling to 63 countries. 79% of those companies were SMEs. In Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2012, the Prime Minister talked about, and I quote, a future in which Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and England continue to flourish side by side as equal partners. Does the Prime Minister still stand by this? Of course, I, I continue to stand by wanting to ensure that all parts of the United Kingdom continue to flourish. I think the best way of doing that is ensuring all parts of the United Kingdom remain in the United Kingdom. Ian Blackford. Well, of course, Mr Speaker, the emphasis was on equal. And we're faced with the situation that there's a power grab by Westminster. And it's no surprise that the Scottish and Welsh governments are putting forward continuity bills to stop the power grab by Westminster. Mr Speaker, the Foreign Secretary's leaked letter on the Irish border shows he can't get to grips with one of the most fundamental issues of Brexit. The Foreign Secretary compared crossing the Irish border to going between Camden and Westminster. Frankly, you could not make this stuff up. This is a UK government that is prepared to put at jeopardy the Good Friday Agreement. Does the Prime Minister agree with her bumbling Foreign Secretary, who is making the United Kingdom a laughingstock? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, this government is absolutely committed to the Belfast Agreement. Indeed, we made sure that that commitment was included in the joint report that we agreed with the European Union last December. So that commitment to the Belfast Agreement stands, and we are committed to the Belfast Agreement and the institutions under the Belfast Agreement. He refers to this issue of uh, devolved powers, which are coming back from the European Union. That was his, uh, that was his reference. We have also given an absolute commitment to amending Clause 11, and that commitment remains unchanged. My right hon. Friend, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, has recently met with representatives of devolved administrations. Uh, he acknowledged he put forward a further proposal for them, which ensured that more powers are directly devolved to the Scottish and Welsh governments and in due course with the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, and it was acknowledged that that was a significant step forward. And I have to say to the right hon. Gentleman, talks about the continuity bills. Well, the proposals being put forward are unnecessary. It would be rather more helpful if he was to, continue to, co- if he was to concentrate on reaching an agreement in relation to the withdrawal agreement, because we want to ensure more powers are devolved to the devolved administrations. That's what we are going to deliver. Tim Lawton. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker, back in the real world, last year Network Rail paid out £181 million in compensation to train operating companies for cancellations and delays, yet only £74 million of that was passed on to passengers. Why should train operators benefit financially from failure to deliver a decent service when it's the passengers who suffer the agro inconvenience and cost? And what is she planning to do to make sure the money goes to the rightful place, the passengers? 
can I say to uh, can I say to my honourable friend the, that yes, he's right that real rail operators are compensated. They're compensated when there's disruption on the tracks run by network rail. So it's a compensation for something that has happened not as a result of their doing, but actually as a result of uh, something that network rail is doing. Yes, we do ensure that there is also compensation available to uh, to those who suffer from the disruption, to the passengers who suffer from the disruption. I'm pleased to say that automatic payments are available from many rail operators, um, but not everybody can be automatically refunded. But we are operating a delay replay scheme, which means that everyone, regardless of their ticket type, can have access to the compensation that they deserve. We want to ensure that passengers do get the compensation that they deserve when their journeys are disrupted. David Simpson. Thank you. Mr Speaker, I would ask the Prime Minister to reinforce her earlier comments. Given the imminent publication from the EU of draft legal text arising from December's joint report, will the Prime Minister confirm that she will never agree to any trade borders between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom? Well, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that we continue to stand behind all of the commitments that we made in December, and my negotiating team will work with the Commission to agree how they should be translated into legal form in the withdrawal agreement. But he's right. The draft legal text the Commission have published would, if implemented, undermine the UK common market and threaten constitutional integrity of the UK by creating a customs and regulatory border down the Irish Sea and no UK Prime Minister could ever agree to it. I will be making it crystal clear to President Juncker and others that we will never do so. Um, We are committed to ensuring that we see no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, but the December text also made clear that uh, there should continue to be trade between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom, as there is today. Mr Simon Clarke. Unemployment has fallen faster in the North East than anywhere else in our country. The next step to put rocket boosters under the economy on Teesside will be to create a free port at Teesport. Will my right honourable friend look seriously at this idea, which has great support from Teesville Mayor Ben Houchen and local business leaders? Can I say to my honourable friend that when I visited uh, Ben Houchen and visited Teesport, this was one of the proposals that they uh, they did put to me. I'm very happy to join with him in welcoming the fall in unemployment that we've seen in the North East, and there are a number of ways in which we are uh, providing and ensuring that we see that economic growth continuing in the North East, and that's why we're investing £126 million through the Tees Valley Local Growth Deal. Uh, I know my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has confirmed recently we do remain open to ideas that could drive growth and provide benefits to the UK and its people, and so we'll keep all these uh, options under consideration. Mike Amesbury. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Agents from the Shell Gas Company in Ineos recently posted a pre-named contract to my constituent, Alison Davis, asking her to agree to a geological survey on her farm. Alison had already rejected this request when she was doorstepped a few days earlier. Does the Prime Minister know what it feels like to get a, an unsolicited letter from a group who won't take no for an answer? <laughs> And will she join the Welsh and Scottish governments by saying no to fracking in England? I say to the honourable gentleman that, that shale gas extraction, shale gas extraction could be a very important part of ensuring energy security in this country. And I'm sure all his constituents and the constituents of others represented in this House will want to ensure the government is doing everything it can to ensure we maintain our energy security and we don't see the lights being turned off. Michael Tomlins. Mr Speaker, it's obvious that there will be concern about the draft from the EU of the withdrawal agreement. Can the Prime Minister assure me that when she responds, she will have uppermost in her mind the importance of both preserving and also strengthening the union of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? My honourable friend raises an important point. And first of all, if I can reiterate the uh, point that I made in response to an earlier question, we're very clear that we want to ensure that we are able to see that trading, that uh, movement between uh, all parts of the United Kingdom, that common single market within the United Kingdom uh, that all parts of the United Kingdom benefit from. 
and we are committed to protecting and enhancing our precious union of uh, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The devolved administration should be fully engaged in preparations for the UK's exit. They are. Discussions have been taken uh, from them, and as I said earlier, also in response to the, leader of the, uh, the Westminster leader of the SNP, it is our intention that the vast majority of powers returning from Brussels will start off in Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast, not in Whitehall, but we will continue. We will continue to talk to the devolved administrations because we also need to ensure that we maintain the single market of the United Kingdom. Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last December's uh, report, the joint report, guaranteed continuing unfettered access for Northern Ireland businesses into the UK internal market. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that the EU appears now to be trying to cherry pick that agreement? by ignoring such critical comments to our economy. Well, can I say to the honourable gentleman that it is absolutely clear. I mean, first of all, we do stand by the commitments we made uh, in December, and we're going to work. The negotiating team will be working with the Commission to agree how we put that into legal text for a withdrawal agreement. Part of that agreement was, of course, that we will see no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Another part was, as the honourable gentleman had said, that there would be uh, guaranteed access for Northern Ireland business to the United Kingdom market. As I said earlier, and I am happy to repeat again, the draft legal text that the Commission has has published, if implemented, would undermine the UK common market and threatens the constitutional integrity of the UK by creating a customs and regulatory border down the Irish Sea. No UK Prime Minister could ever agree to it, and I will be making that absolutely clear. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Can I welcome the uh, Prime Minister's very firm reaffirmation of her commitment to the Good Friday Agreement and the open border uh, and to the December agreement she made on the withdrawal terms, which included, if necessary, full regulatory convergence on both sides of the border. Does she accept that means, if necessary, there will be full regulatory convergence between the United Kingdom and the European Union? Uh, Can I perhaps at this stage, prior to my speech on Friday, refer my right honourable and learned friend to the uh, uh, speech that I made in Florence last year, which set out very clearly that we recognise that there will be some areas where we will have the same objectives as the European Union and we want to achieve those objectives in the same way. There will be other areas where we have the same objectives but we want to achieve those objectives by different means, and there will be other areas where actually our objectives will differ. What matters is that it is this United Kingdom that will be able to take the decisions about the rules that it applies. Julie Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the roads in my constituency of Burnley are in a terrible state of repair. In all my life, I've never seen such a mess. Small potholes are being left by Lancashire County Council to become big potholes, and in several cases, these are merging to become trenches. The situation is dangerous for elderly pedestrians. Cyclists take their life in their hands. Motorists either damage their cars or swerve to avoid them. Does the Prime Minister? agree with me that this is an unacceptable state of affairs and that not least because of the failure to, of a stick uh, order no no sit down order this is very discourteous the remainder of the honorable lady's question will be heard. It's as simple and unarguable as that. At no point people ranting from a sedentary position. The Honourable Lady will be heard on her feet, and that's the end of the matter. Jenny Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that this is an unacceptable state of affairs, not least because the failure to put one stitch in time is leading to far more expensive repairs? Well, can I, can I say to... <laughs> Can I say to the Honourable Lady that we all recognise the uh, issue of potholes and the importance of the issue of potholes. It's right why my Honourable Friend, the uh, uh, member for Northampton North, actually raised this a while back. And actually, as a government, we put more money precisely into the issue of dealing with potholes. But she, she, she talks about a stitch in time. I'm afraid I won't take any of that from a Labour Party that, when in government, failed to mend the roof while the sun was shining. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So next week we celebrate International Women's Day, celebrating the achievements of women globally. 
with a record of action on the gender pay gap, with more women in work and more childcare to help them, doesn't the Prime Minister agree with me that it's the Conservatives while in government with two female Prime Ministers that are really delivering for women? Can I say to my honourable friend that she's absolutely right. I'm happy to join her in celebrating International Women's Day because I want girls who are growing up today to know that they can achieve anything that they want. But how far they go is about them and their abilities and their willingness to work hard. We do see female employment at a joint record high. There are 1.2 million women-led businesses now. That's the highest since records began. And the gender pay gap is at a record low for full-time employment. That is a Conservative party in government that is delivering for women. Grogan! Will the Prime Minister support the joint endeavours of 18 Conservative and Labour councils from Yorkshire the Yorkshire CBI, the Yorkshire Institute of Directors, the Yorkshire TUC, His Grace the Archbishop of York, in their efforts to get an all Yorkshire devolution settlement by 2020 with the first directly elected mayor from God's own county. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that we are committed to devolving powers to local areas where it will deliver better local services uh, and greater value for money and clear accountability. I'm pleased to say we've already agreed an ambitious devolution deal with Sheffield City Region, which will bring, when completed, around one billion of new investment to the area. I hear the enthusiasm he's set forward for more uh, devolution in Yorkshire, and I'm pleased to say that uh, I believe my right honourable friend, the uh, uh, Housing uh, Secretary actually met with a group of councils from Yorkshire yesterday to discuss these very ideas. Excellent to see the Right Honourable Gentleman Member for Old Bexley and Sidcup back in his place. James Brokenshire. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is very good to be back. Uh, Last year, I had the privilege to open the Guy's Cancer Centre at Queen Mary's Hospital in Sidcup in my own constituency, not knowing then how relevant that might be to be. I pay tribute to the NHS and the outstanding people who work within it, and my own treatment has been absolutely outstanding. But I know that early diagnosis and early treatment is key. And therefore, with this in mind, Uh, Will my right honourable friend see that the Lung Health Check Programme announced by NHS England last November is implemented as speedily and as widely as possible? And will she do all that she can to challenge the stigma attached to lung cancer and some of the false judgments that are made so that it receives the attention it deserves and those suffering with the disease receive the care that they need. Well, can I say to my right honourable friend that I am absolutely delighted to see him back in his place in this house. And can I also commend him for the interviews that he gave over the weekend and the way he spoke about his own experience. And he's absolutely right about early diagnosis. And can I say, I think the message that my right honourable friend gave from his experience needs to be one that we all promote uh, around the country, which is if there is the slightest doubt for someone, if something happens that you think is potentially problematic and, and the sign of something, then please go to the doctor and get it checked out. Don't, there, are many men, there are many men, particularly, who think, oh, no, well, you know, it's better not to, we won't, we'll just put up with it. Actually, go get it checked out, because, crucially, in cancer and in many other areas, but in cancer like lung cancer, as my right honourable friend has said, if that early diagnosis and early action can be taken, then it means an enormous difference to the patient. Uh, and I can assure him that we are looking very carefully and monitoring the effectiveness, particularly of scanning of high-risk groups, uh, and we'll be looking carefully at the results of that. But as he says, we need to ensure that we get rid of the stigma of lung cancer and that anybody who has the slightest suspicion of a problem actually goes to the doctor, gets themselves checked out and gets the treatment that they need. Ian Mearns. Mr Speaker, for many young people in the North East, employment is precarious and low paid. And since the introduction of the apprenticeship levy, youth unemployment in Gateshead, my constituency, has remained stubbornly constant, while apprenticeship recruitment has actually declined by 35%. Mr Speaker, having a plan to develop a plan is simply not good enough. 
What is the Prime Minister actually going to do, do to resolve the problem of youth unemployment in the north east of England? Yeah. Well, gentlemen, that as uh, I heard from, uh, we heard earlier from my honourable friend from Middlesbrough, actually what we have seen overall in the north east is unemployment. Yes, he says youth unemployment, but overall in the north east we've seen unemployment falling faster than many, many other parts of the country, and that I think is something to be welcomed. We do need to ensure that we are seeing the uh, the uh, work of the um, intended uh, outcome of the apprenticeship levy, i.e. more opportunities for young people actually being put into, uh, into practice. And I'm sure that uh, my on, on, right honourable friend who is responsible for the apprenticeship issue will take up the uh, particular reference that he's made to the apprenticeships in the North East. Gillian Keegan. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last Sunday, we celebrated the achievements of Chichester-born astronaut Tim Peake by honouring him with the freedom of the city. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating Tim and give assurances that our significant investment in the European Space Agency, EU space programmes and research will continue as we leave the European Union? Can I say to uh, my honourable friend that this is an important issue. I was very pleased. One of the first receptions I hosted in number 10 when I became Prime Minister was Tim Peake, uh, and to see the enormous enthusiasm he generated among young people for space and science. And uh, the joint report we uh, agreed with the EU in December made clear that through the multi-annual financial framework we will continue to participate in programmes that are funded by that, and that includes space, but we'll also be uh, discussing with the EU how we can build on our successful cooperation on space as the negotiations uh, proceed. And she will have seen that there have been some important developments, including legislation in this House, that will enable us to take a real forward position in relation to space in the future. Speller. Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister will be aware that the huge new Midland Metropolitan Hospital in Smethwick is currently haunted by the Carillion Collapse. However, it's already two-thirds finished, and the longer the restart of work is delayed, the more the ultimate costs will rise. Yet only this week, more project management staff were laid off. So will the Prime Minister commit to getting this site back to work, instruct her ministers, especially in the Department of Health and the Treasury, to get a grip of this project, get the work rolling again next month, and complete this much-needed hospital? Yeah. Well, uh, I understand that... Uh, over 8,000 Carillion workers have had their jobs safeguarded, but of course that is no comfort to those who have found themselves being made redundant and the, their families of those that have been re made redundant. He raises a specific point about the Midland Metropolitan Hospital. The Department of Health and Social Care and, and NHS Improvement are working with the Trust and the PFI company so that work can recommence as soon as possible. Freeman. Speaker, will my right hon. Friend agree that behind the smiling beard of the Leader of the Opposition lies the real threat to this country's economy, the Shadow yeah. Chancellor and his reheated hard-left Marxism. Can she reassure me and the businesses of this country that this party will put jobs, prosperity and growth before ideology? Yeah. We're going to talk about beards, we're going to talk about policy. We don't want to talk about the Honourable Gentleman's beard either, but we will talk about policy, and that's what the Prime Minister, I know, will address. The Prime Minister. Well, can I say to my Honourable Friend, that he is absolutely right that if we want to build a strong economy with high skilled, high paid jobs for the future, the way to do that is not to go out borrowing hundreds of billions of pounds and bankrupting our economy. The Labour Party will be a real threat to the economy of this country, but more than that, they'd be a threat to the jobs of hard working people up and down this country. Nothing, Edwards! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dear uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this week is the seventh anniversary of the 2011 referendum in Wales, where the people of, of, of my country overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly supported full legislative sovereignty over devolved policy areas. Despite the perceived concessions in this week's speech by the de facto Deputy Prime Minister, the withdrawal bill will drive a sledgehammer through the Welsh Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it the reality that under her plans for Brexit Britannia, Wales will be a rule taker, a vassal country? Yeah. to the honourable gentleman that he is wrong in what he says about what we're proposing in relation to the devolved administrations we will be devolving far more powers to the devolved administrations indeed that is something that this government has done only recently in the wales act we have seen new uh, powers being devolved to the uh, welsh uh, welsh government we are absolutely clear that we want to see the vast majority of powers returning from uh, brussels starting off in edinburgh cardiff 
and Belfast and not in Whitehall. But we're also clear that where powers are related to the UK as a whole, it makes sense for us to ensure that they continue to rules continue to apply across the whole of the United Kingdom in the same way. Julia Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To celebrate World Book Day tomorrow, would the Prime Minister join me in backing the Share a Story child literacy campaign to make 10 minutes of daily reading with a child as much a national habit as eating five pieces of fruit and veg? I say to my honourable friend, I'm very happy to join her in welcoming Share a Story campaign and in marking World Book Day, uh, which I think is a day to enjoy and celebrate reading. As a child, I very much enjoyed reading, and I think this idea of trying to ensure that uh, we see 10 minutes of reading every day with a child becoming a natural habit for everybody is extremely important, and I would certainly support that. Liz Kendall. Sunday's explosion in Leicester has been a terrible shock to the local community. I know all of our thoughts are with the families and friends of those who tragically lost their lives and those that have been injured. I thank the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition for praising our incredible emergency services who are continuing to work in extremely difficult circumstances. Will the Prime Minister also pay tribute to our local residents who have pulled together to support one another, showing great strength and courage? And will she make sure we get all the support we need to get to the bottom of what's happened and to help my constituents put their lives back together again? Can I say to the Honourable Lady that, as we, uh, both I and she said, the Leader of the Opposition said earlier, we express our condolences to the family and friends of those who were sadly killed in this tragedy, but also we recognise the impact that it has on the local community. And as she said, I'm very happy to pay tribute to local residents who have shown, I think, the real value of community in the way that they have come together on this. And I can assure her that everything will be done to get to the bottom of why this happened and to ensure, as far as possible, depending on the cause, obviously, that it would not happen to anybody again. Mr Philip Davis. Mr Speaker, uh, last year I attended a meeting in the House of Lords organised by the wonderful crossbench peer and human rights campaigner Baroness Cox, uh, which three very brave women told us their harrowing tales of how they had been treated and discriminated against by Sharia councils. It's amazing, Mr Speaker, how noisy feminists in this place are so quiet about this issue when women are being discriminated yeah, against so yeah. blatantly in this country. Yeah, yeah. Isn't, it, isn't it time, isn't it time, isn't it time this alternative discriminatory form of justice was no longer tolerated in this country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I say to uh, my honourable friend, that we're very clear that there is one rule of law in the United Kingdom, that is, uh, and that is uh, British law. But uh, he's right, and I myself have also heard stories from individual women who have been discriminated or felt that they've been discriminated and treated badly as a result of decisions by Sharia courts. That's why, when I was Home Secretary, I set up the review into uh, Sharia courts. Uh, and that is a review which I believe has recently published its report. And my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, will be responding to that uh, shortly. Thank you. Frank Field. Victims working, uh, sorry, organisations working with the uh, victims of uh, modern slavery report that tomorrow the government's cutting their miserable daily living allowance. Will the Prime Minister stop that cut? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, can I commend him for the interest and work that he has done in the issue of modern slavery and human trafficking and uh, all our efforts to uh, stop this terrible and horrendous crime that takes place? Uh, we our benefit system is there to provide a safety net for people. We have been putting changes in place to make sure that we give more help to the people who need it most. In relation to the specific issue that he has raised, I'm not aware of the, uh, of the details, but I know that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, will want to look at the specific issue that he has raised. Mr. Speaker, free independent press is vital to our country. Does she share my concerns about the links Max Mosley has with Impress and the links Max Mosley has with some of our leading politicians? Can I, can, I, can, I, can I say to my honourable friend, I think some people will, be, will have been surprised to learn of those links with uh, some leading politicians. Um, but can I also say to her that I absolutely, absolutely agree with her that a free press is very important. It underpins our democracy. 
and whatever they say about us, whatever they write about us, actually it's important that they are able to hold politicians, the powerful, to account, and they are able to shine a light in some of the darkest corners of our society. And as far as I'm concerned as Prime Minister, while I'm Prime Minister, that will never change. Jane Jardine. Thank you. Um, Edinburgh Airport has recently launched its uh, noise abatement consultation process. But given that um, aviation is a reserved matter, will the Prime Minister undertake that her agree that her government will undertake an investigation of whether the level of night flights at Edinburgh Airport has now reached the same level as was reached at Stansted when it was regulated? Thank you. Well, the, uh, can I say to the Honourable Lady that I wasn't aware of the work that was being done at Edinburgh Airport, but I'm very happy to ask the Department for Transport to look at the particular issue that she has raised. Finally, Simon Hall. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure that the whole House would agree uh, that the value of peace is priceless. Can I ask my right honourable friend to confirm her support for, and indeed that, that the Good Friday Agreement is safe in her hands. Yeah. Well, my honourable friend has raised an important point, and I should uh, recognise that, of course, this April will mark the 20th anniversary of the historic Belfast Agreement. And that agreement has been fundamental, together with its successors, in helping uh, Northern Ireland to move forward from its violent past to a brighter and more secure future. I can assure my uh, honourable friend that this government remains absolutely committed to the Belfast Agreement. Our commitment to that agreement is steadfast. Thank you. Order.